Must mean we're getting ready to go. Are we ready? Time to go? Excellent. Hello. I'm Jeffrey Snover. Uh, welcome to uh, PowerShell Unplugged. Welcome to New Orleans. Are you guys having fun in New Orleans? Yeah? Okay. Excellent. Excellent. We're going to have some fun here today. Uh, I'm uh, just pleased. I'm just immensely pleased to be able to show you one of my favorite things in the world, PowerShell. Uh, and this is the PowerShell Unplugged session. So this really started when I um, did a keynote in a conference in, um, in Norway, in Oslo. And uh, I, I was going to do a keynote and then a beginner's PowerShell session. And so during my keynote, I went out and I asked, well, how many people know PowerShell? And it turned out like everyone raised their hands. And I thought, well, maybe there's a language barrier here. Maybe they don't understand my question. And so during the session, you know, various things, I talked to people and they all knew PowerShell. I thought, well, that's going to be difficult for a beginning PowerShell session. And then that evening, we had a, uh, a um, what the heck am I, where am I? Oh, oh I'm off by one. Okay, there you go. So anyway, during, my, during the evening, we had a panel session, and uh, they were asking people a strange question. They asked them, well, what command do you use the most? What PowerShell command do you use the most? And one guy was talking about Active Directory, and somebody else was talking about security. And I'm sitting there, like, blah, blah, blah. and they asked me. And I said, well, get help. And everybody laughed. And it's like, well, why are they laughing? And I think they, they were laughing because here I am, you know, sort of venter PowerShell, been working with it forever, and the command I used most is get help. And I realized that, ah, they did not realize, you know, they thought I was making it up. It's like, no, I use get help all the time. And that's the power of PowerShell. And uh, what I decided to do was to redo my talk then and there. And the next morning I just said, hey, I'm going to show you get help and how I use get help and why I use get help and how this is the essence of PowerShell. That PowerShell is not about sitting there and, and memorizing things and, 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 and uh, doing stuff. It's about figuring things out. It's about exploring things. And in particular, that's the way you should learn PowerShell and it's the way you should continue to use PowerShell. And so that's what this session's gonna be, just about how I use PowerShell. So that's why it's PowerShell Unplugged. Literally, I got like one slide, and, and, and that's it, and that's for backup, that's for reference. Okay, so there's no slides, just pure demos. And I'm gonna show you how I use PowerShell. Now, just to be really crisp about this, I really have no plan, like no plan. I got no demo script, I just, I just don't. So I'm going to make mistakes, et cetera. And that's part of the process, right? I want you to see how I actually use the product and I mistype things. I make mistakes all the time. And that's okay. And you should feel, when you make mistakes, you should realize, yeah, Jeffrey makes the same mistakes. So, you know, making mistakes and learning from your mistakes is fine. And that's what we want to show. Anyway, so let's just switch and, and have some fun. And I'll show you how I use PowerShell. Okay, so here's my desktop. Start from, from complete scratch. And you got your basic choice, right? You can use the command line window. <clears throat> yeah. And this is great, but we have the new PowerShell ISE. And I actually prefer ISE. I, I actually did not like the first version of ISE. I thought we got the user interface wrong. But this one I like quite a bit. And I'll show you a couple of, of features. So first, let's get rid of this one because we're not going to use it. Okay, so here you have uh, three planes, panes, or two panes, okay? Two panes, you have script, oh, sorry, we'll show that one later. You've got script, where if you type something in and hit carriage return, nothing happens. And the command line interface, where if you type something in, something does happen. Something does happen, oh yeah, something does happen, okay? And you've got a split screen here, okay, you can move things back and forth. Okay, so there you go. That's the basics of ISA. Now, the great thing about ISC is that it supports things like IntelliSense. Okay, so when I put a dash, I get things there. But again, the way you want to start is with help. Okay, get help. And again, that did nothing. So you want to either, you can either go down here and type it, or in ISC, you can select something and hit F8. And if you hit F8, it runs down here. You're like, okay, great. And so now I'll scroll back up and blah, blah, blah. 
Okay, and there's my help. But notice here, I got get process, and, and you'll find in the beginning of the help was a bit of, a, of an issue, right? I gotta go, okay, here's the help. And let's say I find something interesting, like, oh, update help. And I wanna start typing that. Oh, look, way I'm down here, and I lost my help. Okay, so one of the things you can do is you can say get help minus show window. And there, we put it in a window. And notice, this is pretty cool, because you can start searching for things update and you see you got 11 matches and you go to the next 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 and you go to previous okay so that's pretty cool the downside with uh, show window in in particular in this environment this works fantastic when you got a big monitor or multi monitors because you just take this one and you move it over to the other monitor and then you type here but you notice here if I want to start doing something you know the helps always in front so that's kind of a pain in the butt so the technique I'm going to use for this demo is get help pipe to clip. You pipe it to the clipboard. And then Control N gives you a new tab and edit window. Control V pastes it. And now I got my help up here. I got my help up here. Right? And so now it's nice and separate, et cetera. So that's a very useful technique, okay? Now the reason why this is cool is because um, there are various things you can do here. So you can say, get help minus online. And again, select and hit F8. And you get help in the browser. So one of the two most important tools in using PowerShell are ISE, because it's just our version 3 it's just a rock star tool and the browser you're gonna use the browser a lot by the way I should have asked my I should have found out about my audience so how many of you uh, have not used PowerShell are here for the beginners flavor okay good 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 and how many of you are like expert PowerShell guys and then everybody else in the middle okay great okay so it'll be a little bit for each of you Okay? At times, you beginners are going to see stuff that you're just going to go right over your head. At times, you experts are going to be like, what? It's showing help. Don't worry about it. There'll be a little bit for each of you. Okay. So that's the update. That's the help, get help online. Okay? So now let's actually take a look at some of this help. So first is um, you should be aware that we actually don't ship the help. Yeah, we switched that in version three. Turned out we were shipping a ton of help in all the languages. It was big, it was bloated, and it was stale, which is to say um, you had to code, finish the, the documentation at the same time you finished the code, and therefore, you know, as you, know, you had fixes in the code, et cetera, or you found bugs in the documentation, and the answer was, hey, just hang in there, uh, you know, a couple years, we'll update the help again in a couple years. And now we've moved to an online publishing model where you update the help, you get only the help that you want. So if you speak English, you don't get Lithuanian help. If you speak Lithuanian, you don't get English help. Uh, you get just the help you want, and so you get that. And as we find issues, people go and they'll take a look and they say, that doesn't make any sense. They'll respond to us. We're able to uh, publish fixes very, very quickly. So one of the best practices is to update your help uh, on a regular basis. And the way you do that is update, well here, let's say, get help, let's do, sorry, let's, I just had it, update help. So notice, it gives you the parameters, update help, minus module, minus source path, et cetera, and gives you a detailed description of what's going on. The parameters, a lot of people ask me, hey, what's the best book to buy? And there's a lot of great books to buy using PowerShell. I think people don't start with the help. I think you ought to start with the help. The help is actually pretty darn good. And while the books are great and they'll help structure things for particular scenarios, uh, the help is actually pretty darn good. Okay, so here's how you do an update help. Say, here, I'm going to do this in a separate window. Okay, and then what I did there was Control T. Control T brought me up a new run space. This is a new session. And I'm going to do it in a different session because this will take a while. I'll say update help minus IntelliSense tab, IntelliSense module. And here I'm going to update it for all the modules. Yeah, let's do it for all the modules. And uh, force. And I'll do verbose. Okay. So now what this is doing is it's taking a look on your system, finding all the modules that you have, 
opening up those modules, taking a look for the help URI, and if you're connected on the internet, it will go out, grab that help, and bring it down and uh, install it. Okay? Now, it, what, you might ask yourself, well, what if I don't, what if I'm not connected to the internet? Not a problem, we thought about that. And so what you're able to do is, on a machine where you're, able to, where you're connected to the internet, you pick up the help and store it in a location, you can put it on a USB drive, and then you can update the help from that location. So you take, get on a USB drive, go to the machine that it is not connected on the internet, give it to it, and update the help from there. So you see here we're grabbing all that good help in the background. Okay, so that's help. All right. Actually, I had a couple notes. Okay. So get help clip. Okay, so the first thing you want to understand about PowerShell is that it is command oriented. And command oriented is this idea of we want to create a world where you think about what you want, you type it, and you get it. So everything's verb noun based. So we've seen it already. When you want to get help, what do you type? Get help. Okay? If you want to get processes, what do you type? Get process. If you want to type, if you want to get the services, or if you want to stop a service, you type stop service. Okay? And so one of the issues there is, um, well, what are the verbs? Like nouns, you know there's going to be an infinite number of nouns. But what are the verbs? Well, you have two choices here. One is, let anybody do anything they want with verbs. Honestly, I've lived in that world. That's a pretty, pretty ugly world. <laughs> right? Um, you think uh, stop process. That's the right thing to do. But you say, no, you're an idiot. It's, it's, you're killing the process. And this is, oh, that's, that's a, a bad way to think about it. You should terminate a process. And so each one of you is going to pick your own verb. And then you guys are all going to be like, well, how do I do this? Again, we want a world where you think about things, you type them, and you get them. Now, first, you need to learn how to think about things, right? So what we've done is we've restricted the verb set uh, so that you can learn those verbs so that you then, when you say, I want to think, type, get, you know the verbs in a, ahead of time. So any guesses as to how you'd get the verbs? Oh, I like this crowd. Okay. So that's exactly right. You say get, verb. And there are the verbs. Now here, again, uh, ISC is great. Now, it turns out that the right way to do this is to actually make it smaller. And when it's smaller, smaller font, and you can do that with control minus or control plus, okay, um, shrink it, et cetera, this is quite usable. When it's large enough to show in a, si in a room this size, uh, you want to use other methods like that clipboard, et cetera. One of the other great mechanisms is, hey, I'd like to output this through a, through, into a grid. Right? And so you want to output this to a grid. The way you do that is get verb, pi2, out grid view. And here you're showing it in a grid. Okay? And so then it's a little easier to, to interact with. Now, out grid view is your friend. Okay? So here it shows you the groups. You got common verbs, you have data verbs. Excuse me. So we've grouped the verbs by area, life cycle verbs, approve, assert, complete, deny, etc., and diagnostics, communication, security. Okay? So these are the verbs. Now, if you want to, you can search for things, right? So what did I say? Stop. Oh, there you go. So as I begin typing here, I do filtering. Okay? And this filtering works against uh, any of the fields. Alternatively, you can get clever. And you can say, oh, I'd like to do a group that contains O, M, O, S, E. Okay? And so here we're finding just the, um, uh, just the items where the group contains S, E. And you see this is a drop-down box. Pretty rich thing. So out grid view is your friend. Okay, so now let's get back to things. Um, as a kid, I used to study karate, this Okinawan style of karate. And the basic form was something called San Chen, right? The base, all the learners, all the beginners units learn that thing, and you study it over and over and over again. 
And they had this phrase, and that was that all things are San Chen, which is to say even the most expert of admins or expert of uh, practitioners still learn from this most basic form that in that basic form all the elements of the style were there and you just learn and learn and learn from it. Well in PowerShell we have an equivalent and it's processes. We actually, uh, when you want to learn about PowerShell, you should focus in on processes and get process. And why? And it turns out that all the elements of the language and the system are in get process uh, because it's actually a, it's available everywhere. It's a pretty safe thing to do. And so it's, a, it's your playground. You want to learn about PowerShell, you explore with processes. So if you wanted to get process, okay, well, you're falling down there. If you wanted to get processes, you'd get process. Okay, so let's clear the screen. Get process. Okay, so it's as simple as that. I want to get process. But now the question is, okay, well, what if I don't want all those processes, right? What if I want those, you know, whose name is uh, like, uh, I want to just get the explorer ones, right? Well, here's what you can do. You can say get process minus, oh, and look, there's name. And I could have said, I explore. Oh, look, there's, there's, I'm cheating here. There's tab completion for names. Okay, well, imagine you didn't have that. So you could type that. But I wonder if I use wildcards. Oh, wildcards work. So one of the things you should learn about PowerShell is that I am a deeply flawed human. And as a deeply flawed human, I've made PowerShell the tool that I'd want to use. So I'm a really lousy typist. I'm just a terrible typist. So, you know, I explore. Not sure I can spell that correctly. So I can just type IE star and it autocompletes. There's a bunch of places where you have autocompletion, IntelliSense, et cetera. Again, to kind of make up for my personal failings. Now, okay, well, that's great. So in this case, I wanted, I didn't want all the processes, I wanted a subset by name. So what other things can I subset things by? I can do by ID, okay, so I can say my ID 586 happiness. I can do computer name, module, oh, happens there, and file version info. Oh, so file version info wants to work on a particular uh, process. Okay, so if I just type this, I get that process, but then if I type file version info, I got the file version information for it. Okay, so you explore, you go and you start and you start trying, you, you run the command and start trying things. But then what happens if you say, yeah, that's great, but that's not what I want. What I want to do is I want to get those where the handles, handle count is greater than some number. Right, GPS, okay, and you see that uh, I've made a strategic error here. Let me just fix this. There. Okay, sorry about that. So, what happens if I want to get those where the handles are greater than that? Now, how many people are greater than, say, 500? How many of you have a Unix background? Oh, okay, pretty hefty. So in Unix, the way you do this is, this is what's called the compositional system. In Unix, Unix is a very strong operating system, and one of the strengths is this idea of compositional management, which is to say the philosophy is to build small tools that do a discrete task, and then when you want to solve something larger, you stitch these things together to solve greater and greater uh, larger and larger tasks. Now this is a very powerful environment because imagine I go to you and I say, no, 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 I'm going to give you a scenario, right? I, yeah, I'm going to find out the, exactly what you do and I'm going to give you a commandlet specifically for that. Well, I'll do that and I'll figure out what you do and, and I'll walk away and 30 minutes after I've walked away, your scenarios have changed, right? You have a new boss, you learn something new, the scenarios constantly change. A compositional model allows you to be able to produce novel solutions to unique problems if and when they occur. So it's all about composition. So you want to have a small set of things and compose them together. Now in Unix, what you'd have to do here is you'd have to say, okay, well I want to go over, I want to do this, and let's see, I got to cut off, let's see, so one, two, three lines, I want to cut off three lines, and then I want to go over, it looks like, like a couple, two, one, two, three, four, five, and you have to go and you do all this text parsing. 
Well, in PowerShell, you don't have to do text parsing. This is the key innovation of PowerShell, is objects. Now, when you hear objects, don't freak out, right? A lot of people, admins here, oh, you want me to be a programmer. No, 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 no. PowerShell is object-oriented to dramatically simplify the lives of, pro of IT pros, okay? So in a world where, um, in Unix, where you'd have to do all this text parsing, here you just ask for what you want, okay? So when you said, by the way, I typed GPS. GPS is shorthand for get process, okay? So if I just say get process, and what did I say? I wanted the ones where handles were greater than 1,000. And you get it. Remember this thing, think, type, get? Okay, so that's great, but then, well, that's great, but they're not sorted. So, well, what I'd like to do is I'd like to sort them by handles. Oh, now they're sorted. Well, actually, I didn't want to sort them that way. I wanted to sort them descending. Minus descending. Well, that's great, except I didn't want it formatted that way. I wanted it formatted as a table, but what I wanted was the process name and then the handles. See, I can't type. Well, that's great, except they're formatted all wacky. Wouldn't it be great if I could auto-size that table? Okay, so this is the power of PowerShell, the use of objects. The use of objects dramatically simplifies your life. It doesn't make it co more complex. It dramatically simplifies it. It creates a world where you can think about what you want and type it and get it. Why? Because when you t type get process, one, we've got a well-defined set of verbs, so you learn those verbs. How do you learn the verbs? Get verb. You learn those verbs, you learn the nouns, or typically you guess at the nouns, and, um, and, uh, and then you type it. And when you type it, you get the process, you get the output, and then you see these columns, yeah? And those columns are the properties that you can act on. Okay, so very, very simple thing. Now, it turns out it's a little more complex than that. Okay, so this, when I said you pipeline objects, like how do you print an object to the screen? And the answer is we have a formatting subsystem that outputs objects to the screen. In fact, the matter is that until you do that job, it's a full, rich object. And these objects have lots and lots of properties. And if we showed them all to you on the screen, you'd just be confused. I mean, there's just way too much information. And so what we do is we pick the appropriate subset and we show that to you. Now, how do we do that? And the answer is we just pick. And the answer is, well, what if I wanted to see something else? It's, well, what in, in, now I'm going to teach you some objects. Objects have members, okay? We call them properties, but sometimes they're methods. So property, objects have properties and methods and other things. And these things are called members. So if you wanted to find out what the members of something were, you would type get member. I like this crowd. Get process, pipe to get member. And here you see all the members. And this is a little bit confusing, right? It's a little bit. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pipe it to out. Outgrid view is alias to OGV. Outgrid view. And so now I have all the members, okay? And so look at all the things I can do with this. I mean, there's a ton of stuff here, right? Um, here, by the way, you click on the sorted, of course. You get company, you can get uh, description, company and description, let's take a look at that. So now I can say get, process, pipe to format, table, name, company, Description. That's pretty darn cool. Okay? So most of these are, are, uh, are Microsoft, but some of them aren't. I wonder which ones aren't Microsoft. So I'd say, well, I want the ones where company um, not, not like star Microsoft.
And again, I can't type, right? So I'm just going to say star. Well, look at that. Okay, so I didn't know this. What do I got here? I got Adobe, I got some Broadcom, some DisplayLink, Lenovo. I'm glad I don't have anything embarrassing. Um, <laughs> I told you, I have no idea what I'm doing here. Okay, so that's actually pretty cool. But now let's take a second here. You say, well, that's nice, but wouldn't it be great to be able to get the processes the way I see them, but also get that, that, um, that company information? Like, wouldn't it be great to be able to group things by company? Right? I want to format things, but I want to group them by company. And again, this is the way I want you to think. Think about what you want to do, and then see if you can type it and find out. Okay, so what did I say? I wanted to say get processes, and then I wanted to format them as a table, and I wanted to group them by company. And look at that. Well, I screwed it up again. Clear screen. Okay, so look at this. It says company, Adobe Systems, Adobe Systems, Broadcom, Microsoft, Display Link, and then Microsoft again. Okay, and so what's going on there? Adobe and Microsoft. They see Microsoft a lot of times. And so here's where you need to understand how our formatting system works. Our formatting system works by getting objects. The first object that comes in there determines what it's going to do with formatting. Okay? So the first object that comes in determines what you're going to do with the formatting. So in this case, it said, oh, I'm going to group things by company name. And so it sees that the company name does that, starts a group, and put things, outputs the objects until it sees a change in company name, in which case it closes out the record, puts in a new one for that group, and does it again. It does not grab up all the objects and then group, and then figure the groups out. And you wouldn't want it to do that, because imagine I was going to group, say, do a dir seek, well, here, I'll show you. You can actually do this. I'll show you the, the, the problem. Let's do a dir, right? So, oh, there, there you go. Okay, so I, it's quite a few of them. And I'm going to see get member. And notice there's something here called, where is it? Extension. By the way, I knew I was looking for something called extension, so I should have done it this way. I should have done get member, something like extend. Oh, and there it is, extension. Okay. So now what I can do is I can do dir pipe to dir, this is pipe to, um, let's say sort extension. Oh, I'm messing this up. Anyway, let's say group by extension. Shows you all the extensions and the grouping. I messed this concept up. What I wanted to say was the reason why we pick the first object and use it for formatting versus grab all the objects to determine the grouping, right, is because imagine I did a dir at the top of the directory and then recursively, so I'm going to do everything, and I wanted to group them by extension. Now, you can do that if you want to, but it's going to be pretty messy, right? You gather all the objects up, and they'd be in memory, and they'd explode your memory size. So instead, we have PowerShell has this streaming model. What that means for you is that when you want to group things um, by something, you'll first want to sort it, and you'll want to do that judiciously, okay? So here, what you do is you want to say, clear screen, um, get process, pipe to sort company, pipe to format table, FT is format table minus group by company. And then it's nice and clean. Microsoft, Microsoft Corporation, Lenovo, DisplayLink, etc. Okay? So let's go back to our um, to our type system. Because the type system is really quite rich. This is a lot of people have the mistaken idea that, that PowerShell is based upon .NET. And that's not quite right. PowerShell is implemented in .NET, but its type system is quite different. Its type system is what we call an adaptive type system. And that says, well, we can deal with different type systems and present them to you in a way that is useful to you. 
So for instance, .NET is pretty straightforward. It shows you the members and the properties. But other things like XML have all these bizarre things like child processing. You know, they have very uninteresting um, properties. And you really have to be a programmer to digest them. Turns out that's pretty common. WMI does that, uh, XML does that, ADSI does that. Lots of people, it's a very programmer view of the world. And so what we do is, you don't want that. So we have these things called type adapters where we adjust those objects into a world that you understand. Now part of that is we then extend things. Now I mentioned to you that objects have properties and members, sorry, properties and methods. But the PowerShell properties have a larger set of things. We have properties and we have methods, but we also have things like, well here we'll group them. There's properties, see it says property, and, and, and we have methods, but notice we have alias properties, okay? Um, alias properties, and what are called script properties. Now notice that company is a script property. Okay, all that stuff that I was showing you, processes don't have a process, don't have a property called company. Okay, so how is it that I was able to do that? And the answer is we have the script property. And what happens is when I access that script property, I then run the script. I take the object. And processes do have a process, a property called main module. So we grab it, and main module has a property called file version info. So we grab it, and file version info has something called company name. And it turns out that that's what everybody wants. But because this was developed by developers, sorry, that's what IT pros want. But because this was developed by a developer, he buried that information way down in the object hierarchy. And so alias uh, script properties are a way to bring that way up uh, so that it's easy for you to access, so that you don't have to go down and find it. Because here's how you would have had to do it otherwise. And here, this is, put your seatbelt on. Okay, so now there's this notion of little bits of code, right? Now we're gonna get a little more advanced. So we say, hey, get process pipe to format table, and I can say name, and here I'm giving the name of properties, but the fact of the matter is, I can give complex stuff. I can say label equals Label, la label equals company, company expression equals, and now I put code in. And I say, I think it's dollar sign under bar dot uh, module, uh, main module name dot file. Boy, is this IntelliSense is a lifesaver. File version info dot company name. By the way, I don't want to do this for everything. One of the other things I do, oh, let me tell you about the great thing called the editor. <laughs> so in the editor, what you can do, is you can make mistakes. Expression is expression. Oh yeah, see I told you, I'm a lousy speller. Label, expression. By the way, I think it's dollar sign on the bar. Um, let's see, main module. Why is it not doing this? Yeah. Module dot file version info dot company. All size. Then, again, hit F8, and I did it wrong. <laughs> I 
Okay, well, this is why you have, this is why we codify these things. Oh, company name. See, I think here it has to be dollar sign underbar. Let's find out. There you go. Okay, so <laughs> um, the point I'm making here is that um, you, you could do this every time, or what you can do is you can codify it as an alias property or script property, and you do that once, and in this case, we've done it for you, um, and then you can um, no longer have to type this complexity, right? You figure out once. This is another PowerShell principle. PowerShell principle is, hey, um, figure it out once and codify it in a way you don't have to figure it out again, okay? So let me be clear about what we did here. So we're doing get process, we're forming it as a table, we can specify any number of properties by their name. Alternatively, what we give, and this syntax here, sorry, this syntax, this at ampersand is a... Um, is a hash table, and the hash table says I want to have a label called company. By the way, okay, so let's just fix this. Star SS and clear screen. Clear screen is your friend. Star SS, there's always, it's always around. You always have CSRSS and LSASS. Um, so it's just a nice way to limit the things you're, you're working on. Okay, so what it said was, I wanted something called, I wanted a label. I could have said, whose company? If I do that again, notice the, the label changes here. Okay, and then I run this expression. Now the object that you're working on is referred to as dollar sign underbar, and you can give any code you want. You can make this as long as you want. Uh, you can write five page script here, right? So for instance here, let's do a, this is a string, we'll do two, two upper. Make it all uppercase, right? Or two, two lower. You can do anything you want. Have a party, it's all goodness, okay? Um, and you can write any code you want. And we, when we see that hash table, we'll break it up and we'll run the code and use the value. But again, that's kind of a painful thing. So what we instead do is we have these alias properties. And what you do is you figure it out once, figure out what you want to do, and then you codify it. Now there's two ways to codify it. In version three, we added something called update type data. So let's take a look at type data. Update type data. And here, What you do is, if you change directory to dollar ps home, you will see type data information. You know, let's stay with objects for a second. This gets a little complicated, pretty complicated pretty quickly. So let's go back to, to let's go all the way back to help. So we talked about help. We talked about the first steps you want to do in the system is help. And then we talked about how you want to explore the system. You use the getters, you learn the verbs, you uh, pipe things to get member to explore what the properties are, and then you operate on those properties, okay? Now, we have, I talked about the compositional system, how you build up the system from small units and manipulate them to build larger solutions. So one of the things you want to be able to do is you want to be able to op operate on objects. So then the question is, what operations can you perform on objects? And so you might expect that there's a set of commandlets that can operate on objects, and you'd be correct. Now at this point I want to bring in one of my favorite other features of ISC, and this is show command. Okay, so this is the window here, show command add-on. You click there, and what this does is it shows you all the commands that are available on your system. And so here you can type things, type process, and we'll filter that list. And so you see, oh, here are the commands I can do. 
get process, debug process, get some processor stuff, start, stop, etc. And if you type object, you see here's a set of object, I'll put dash object there. Here's a set of object utilities that you can operate on. Okay? And if you click on those, we show you the de details. So if you remember, I had done a short descending. Yeah? Uh, you have select object, compare object. So let's explore some of those. By the way, the most powerful and the one you're going to use the most is where object. And this is a bit of a mess. But here's the key thing you want to know about get object. It's actually pretty simple. All that complexity actually makes it very simple for you. What you do is get process type to where. And we have a number of things, right? We've got what we call the simple where. The simple where it says, give me a name, right? Handles, an operator, and a value, right? And that just works. Okay, that's the simplified case. The more general case, and what this is actually built upon, is what we call a script block. Whenever you see these squiggle brackets, it almost always means code. And what we do, originally the way this started off was, as uh, I had one of the developers and I said, hey, we want to effectively do SQL against objects, against live objects. Go do it. Um, Turns out that's a hard job. There's a reason why the SQL team has like thousands of people working for it, because it's a really hard problem. So as he tried to do this, you know, he would only be able to do a subset, and then the syntax was all wacky and didn't quite work. And after a few months, we decided to, to stop that and take an approach that turned out to be dramatically more powerful than SQL, dramatically more powerful than SQL, and it's about three lines of code. Seriously. So like, wow, how can you be dramatically more powerful than SQL in three lines of code. I'll explain the code to you directly. We, when we pipeline to where, we grab the current object, we assign it to a variable, dollar sign underbar. We then run this code. The code evaluates to true, we pass the object on. If it evaluates to false, we don't. That's the code. That's it. Okay, now just to prove that to you, right, so here is the typical way you do this, dollar handles greater than 1,000. So we'll grab each object, grab the handles, and see if it's that. And if it is, we pass it on. If it's not, we throw it away. Okay? Now, remember that I said all we do is we assign the, property, the object to dollar sign underbar, and we evaluate the code. If it returns true, we return pass the object on. If it returns false, we don't. Notice what I didn't say. I didn't say that you have to use the dollar sign underbar variable. You don't have to. And so if I say dollar sign true, everything gets passed on. And if I say dollar sign false, nothing gets passed on. Okay? So that's the way it works. Okay? So typically, you're going to use the underbar, right? That's what makes most sense, but it doesn't have to. I point that out so that you understand the concept. Now, this where can be as rich as you want it to be. It can be a simple expression like this, or it can be something very complex, like um, write host. Well, here, no, let's do this. Um, read host minus prompt. Do you want dollar sign underbar dot process name? Okay, so here it says, hey, do you want this? I'm going to just hit carriage turn. I'll say, do you want this one? I'll say yes, and I get it. I say yes, and I get it. Okay, so this code can be anything. So what I did was I said, hey, I get the processes. I'm going to assign it to dollar sign underbar. And what I do is I just say, hey, ask me, do you want this? And if I hit carriage return and don't provide anything, that's a false. And if I do anything, you know, anything, it's true and returns it. Okay? Control C to exit. 
So that's the power of, of these little bits of script. We call these lambdas or script blocks, and they're very, very powerful. Now, one of the techniques you might say is, well, that's pretty cool, but instead, I don't want to type that in all the time. So what you could do is you could say, sign s equals, you have the script block. Okay, now dollar sign s is the script block. Okay, notice it's the code. And if I wanted to, I can run the code. Okay? So code can be assigned to variables. Data can be assigned to variables. When you run, um, uh, if you want to run the code, you can put an ampersand in front of it. So what that says is get process pipe to where dollar sign s and you replace the code. All right. So I'm getting a little esoteric here. Let's back it up. Okay, so we've talked about get help, talked about get member. The next thing you need to understand is drives, okay? PowerShell has basically two ways to get information. The first way is through commandlets. Commandlets are these noun sorry, verb, noun oriented uh, 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 functions, which essentially return tables of information. Works very, very well. But then not, all, not everything is tabular. There's a bunch of the world which is um, hierarchical. Uh, file systems are hierarchical, Active Directory is hierarchical, et cetera. And so for these things, we have drives, okay? So, and we call them PowerShell drives. And we say get PS drive. And so here, these are the drives on the system. Now notice you see the, the typical drives. You got your C drive, but now we've got some unusual drives. We have an alias drive, we have a certificate drive, we have an environmental drive, we have HKLM. Okay, so let's explore that. So this is unlike regular file systems. So I can CD to HKLM, and look. I can CD into software. So this is the registry. And now when I do a dir, I'm seeing registry items. And so what we've done here is, um, this is not, this is not like the Unix file systems, right? The Unix file systems uh, are able to treat lots of different things as file systems, but they literally are file systems. Um, here what we do is we allow you to interact with lots of different things the way, same way you interact with file systems, but they don't have to be file systems. So in other words, if Unix tried to do this, it would try and represent a registry key as a file. Here we represent a registry key as a registry key. We just allow you to interact with it like a file, okay? So you can do a dir, dir a star. You can do subdirectories, a, you know, um, get child items. You can do recursion. And recurse down, okay? Additionally, you can do, did you notice this one? Get PS drive. Did you notice? Variable drive. What could that be? Dir variable. Colon. It shows you all the variables that you have. Okay? So what does that mean? So variables are things like dollar sign CZZ equals ticket NOLA rocks. Okay? So that's a variable. And if I type dollar CZZ, I get it. And if I now do dir variable, I see that it's there. Okay? If I do a remove item variable CZZ and remove it and type dollar ZZZ, it's gone. Okay? So what you're able to do is you're able to treat variables as drives, drives as variables. 
Okay, so pretty powerful stuff. Now you might ask yourself, what use is that? And the answer is, um, we have lots of, uh, you're able to find your variables. So we have a lot of things in PowerShell to be able to limit uh, resource consumption, and I can never remember them, right? So what you're able to do is you're able to do things like dir variable max. Oh, look. There's maximum error count, maximum variable count, maximum function count, etc. So, if you're ever programming PowerShell and you get an error message saying, hey, you've used too many variables, it's because we have artificially limited the number of variables you can use so that you don't write, uh, to protect yourself against runaway code, protect your systems against runaway code. If it turns out that that's not runaway code, it's just a side effect of the design you chose, you can go in here and change these values. Okay? So, and, and, then, and then you're never going to remember that. <laughs> I guarantee you. Like right now, I could ask you, hey, if you wanted to change the maximum uh, variable count, how would you do it? You'd be able to answer it. Ten minutes from now, you won't. But knowing that it's an inv a variable, you'll be able to go here and find it and change it. Yeah, okay, great question. The question. The question, yeah, great question. The question is, hey, is that localized to your version or does that uh, affect all the sessions? And the answer is it affects your version, the current session. So when I make these changes here, it affects my session. If I want to ch affect other uh, systems, I can only do that at startup time, okay? And so the way you do it at startup time is something called a profile, okay? That is the location of my profile, and it turns out we have a number of different profiles, okay? There is a profile for all users and all hosts, so now we'll get into the details of PowerShell. PowerShell is a, uh, here we're showing it as an integrated scripting environment. Before I showed it in a command line shell, PowerShell itself is an automation engine that runs in a DLL that can then be hosted in lots of different places. I showed you two hosts, the command line interface and this ISE. Uh, System Center hosted in a number of different places. The next version of Orchestrator, the next version of Orchestrator hosts the PowerShell engine and its workflow capabilities and extends it with uh, SQL capabilities, etc. So these are all hosts versus the engine itself. And so what you have is the ability to say, hey, I would like to say for all hosts and all users, here's a file I want to run at the startup, and that can set configuration. Alternatively, you can say, I want all users for the current host, ISC or orchestrator, et cetera. What, things, what environmental settings do you want? You can say current user all hosts or current user current host. So let's take a look at this one. Let's just do that. Okay, so what we did was we created a file that is the current user all host file, and we set a variable test all test of all hosts. So now what that means is, if I create this, and I say dollar sign dollar sign test, that variable's there, and so this is a way you set up environments for people. You set up uh, drives, you set up common variables, uh, extensions, et cetera. Okay. So we talked about drives, we talked about help, um, and I talked about two ways, uh, sorry, I talked about only one way to get um, commands. One is help, and the other is get command. So get command shows you all the commands. Okay, now notice 
we have command type. There's aliases, there's functions, there's commandlets, etc. You get the name in the module. And command get help is different than get command. There's slightly different thing. Get command is gives you all the metadata about the system. So it's very uh, uh, detail oriented. Get help is documentation. So if I say get command, get process, here's what you get. And if I say get help, get process, gives you all the details. Okay? Now, get command, however, has a number of benefits. Get command has things like um, noun, sorry, noun, process, and you get that. Uh, and one of my favorites is um, parameter name. Okay, so you might say, hey, I'd like to find all the things that take a particular parameter name, like um, sim session. Okay, and you see these two parameters, get module minus sim session. Okay, or you might say, um, one of the questions that comes up is, hey, I want to be able to get something and pipe it to something else. What can I pipe it to? And so you say, get process, pipe to, get member. At the very top here, tells you the type name, system.diagnostics.process. And so what you can do is you can say get command, pipe to, get, sorry, pipe, sorry, get command minus, parameter type, and I did that wrong. It was system.diagnostics.process. And what that says is um, you can take any command that generates a process object and you can pipe it to these other commands. Okay? Great. So let's explore help a little bit more because in all things it's in help. So there's get help to clipboard. And here's what I want to show. So you can get help on, in, on, on general help. You can get help on specific commandlets. We showed that with get help, get process. And then you can do it online. So you can say get help, get process online. And it uses your default explorer. Uh, browser to go find the help. Assume we've got an internet connection. Check that back in a second. But then we also have conceptual topics. Titles of conceptual topics begin with about underbar. Okay? So what you're able to do is you say get help about underbar and the topic we'll do is star. And look what we have here. This is all the details. Remember I said you know, a lot of people buy books when they should be using the help? So it tells you everything you want to know about aliases, about arithmetic operators, about the various language elements, and then conceptual concepts, right? About execution policies, advanced functions, advanced function parameters, group policy settings. There's just a ton of great stuff here. Uh, modules, methods, objects. So let's do uh, objects. Help about objects. Clip. Okay. So here, this is a little different than the commandlet help. It has different uh, se sections. It's about topics, tells you this. Um, talks about the various types, properties, and methods. About how to use objects in pipelines. Here it should talk about, yeah, pipelining, 
and about some of the formatting. And then we have, always have these things about see also. So remember, objects have methods and properties and use them in pipelines. So the help tells you other topics you want to go explore. Okay? Oh, sorry. Cancel. You can also do get help and just do a search term. Okay? So it doesn't necessarily have to be the topic itself. So imagine I say, let's see, um, I can say help signing. Okay? And so, okay, those are things that have signing in it. Let's see if I say execution. Execution policies. Okay, well, there you go, execution policies. Um, what I want to get, I, I don't have a topic off the top of my head, but it turns out that what we'll do is we, when we, you give, to give just a term, we look for things that have that name, and if we find it, we show it. If we don't find those, then we go and start doing a full text search of the help. We'll search and find those topics and show it to you. So the help is actually pretty useful in, time, in terms of finding things that you want. Wait, let's see if that help, help ever came back. Right, so help finally came back. So again, online help is always going to have the most recent and uh, most, uh, most current help versions. And here's the details about how to save the help, how to update the help, how to get it. Okay. Now, what it didn't show was commandlet help itself. Okay. So, commandlet help, there's a lot of different uh, views. When I just type, when I just type, excuse me. When I just type get help, get process, what happens is I'm seeing a pretty simple view of things. Okay? I see the name, the syntax, the synopsis, the description, related links, and remarks. But it turns out there's quite a bit more. I could have said, okay, get help minus examples. And here, the examples, right, it'll show you the examples. Get process, get process, format list. And so the help then explains to you things to, you can do. Okay, and it's actually quite useful. <laughs> here's, a, here's the example of the script block, right, pretty complicated script block. And what you can do is you can just copy these and paste them, and that one didn't, that wasn't such a good experiment. This one, right? So the, the help has lots of examples, and they're a great way to go and use the, uh, uh, you cut them, paste them, learn from them, okay? And then lastly, we have this detailed view, get help minus get process minus. So there was um, detailed and full. Detailed gives you all the information. Okay, so it gives you the, the examples. But then notice now the parameters. Okay, in the past we were shown the parameters, we just gave you the name and the type. Here we give you the description explaining what the file version is going to do. Okay, now if you wanted you can just say, I want just the details on a parameter. Again, I can't type, so I'm just going to do that. And it'll give you the details on that particular parameter itself. So the system is very rich. Um, uh, uh, the help system is very rich. It's all about learning to use, learning, the goal here is to teach you how to use PowerShell. The keys are gets, get help, get command, get, um, get PS drive, get member. These are the things that will uh, help you learn the system. And it's a ton of fun. Uh, I talked to you about the adaptive type system. Let me just give you one example of that. Okay.
Okay, so here is a, uh, does anybody deal with uh, XML in their, in their work? Yeah, right, XML, is that a lot of fun? Not so much, pretty hideous stuff. So here is, here's some XML, right? So this is Romeo and Juliet. Okay, and what we're able to do here is we'll say dollar sign X equals XML, cat, Romeo and Juliet, and we've cat that file, which is typed it, and we've cast it to XML, and now we can treat it like an object. Act, here are the acts, act zero, dot scene, dot speech, Okay. In fact, okay, so what this says is get the XML document, grab the play, grab all the acts, grab all the speeches, grab, grab all the scenes, grab all the speeches, and then I'm going to group them by speaker. And I'm going to sort it by count. What that says, if you're ever into this, you want to be Romeo or Juliet and not the, uh, the second watchman because he's only got one line. Okay? So this is the, the, it's part of the power of PowerShell, right? The ability to grab objects, whatever form they're in, whether .NET, I mean, we do great with .NET, right? .NET's a great type system, uh, but there's a lot, of, a lot of stuff out there which is messy. XML, ADSI, WMI. PowerShell wraps these objects, use our adaptive type system to present them into a world that you can uh, understand and manipulate and be simple. Then we have a set of base utilities and, ob and uh, functions that allow you to manipulate these things. And again, the whole point of this is to explore, explore, explore. Uh, at some point you might say, but wait a second, maybe something's, you know, maybe uh, Maybe that exploration is going to screw up my system. Maybe it's dangerous to explore. And that's true. It might. Uh, there are two solutions to that. The first is virtual machines and snapshots. Those are, that's, that's your good friend. Uh, but the other one is um, we've tried to make PowerShell as much a, a, a safe tool as possible. Let me see. We're actually kind of schizophrenic on this. We are going to, you can really hurt yourself with PowerShell. We want to give admins whatever tools they need to get the job done, and sometimes those tools can be dangerous. And so you really want to, um, we give you the opportunity to hurt yourself. On the other hand, what we want to do is we want to give you a world where um, you can protect yourself. So let's just say I did this. I wanted to say get process, and I wanted to stop them. No, let's do this one. Let's say I wanted to be, do a rich regular expression. I wanted to grab everything with a B through a T and a dot star, everything that then ends with a G through W. Yeah? And I want to stop them. And the question is, should I do it or should I not do it? Right? Might be good, might be bad, might end my job. Okay? So whenever you find yourself in this situation, and by the way, you're going to find yourself in this situation many times, uh, we have what we call what if. What you're able to do is type what if. Oh, I did it wrong. And what we will do is we will find, we will tell you all the things that we would have done, but we don't do them. Okay? Um, so whenever you're, whenever you're in trouble, just type minus what if, and it tells you what it'll do, and we won't do it. Now, on the other hand, if you say, well, that's close, but that's not quite right, you can type minus confirm. And minus confirm will ask you for each one. Do you want to kill that one? Uh, no. Do you want to kill that one? No. Do you want to kill that one? No. You can say no to all. Okay? Um, so it's very helpful in this regard, right? Minus what if and minus confirm are your friends. Okay? And of course, snapshots, they're your ultimate friend. We also have this notion of high in, uh, impact levels, okay? So if I wanted to say, get process LSASS, now this, I hope this works right. 
It's not a process. Turns out that if you kill LSASS, your demos stop really, really quickly as your system reboots. Okay? So we do, let's make sure. There you go. It says, hey, um, we notice I didn't type confirm or, or what if. And the reason, for, and, but it still asked me for this. And the reason why is that the commandlet understands high impact things. And for high impact things, in, in this case, it's defined as uh, if you're trying to delete a process that you didn't start, then it makes, it goes and asks you about that. Hey, are you sure you want to do that? And I'll say no. Next is there's something called a confirmation level. Each one of the commandlets are are uh, declared with their impact level. Get process, no impact to the system. Stop process, may have a high impact. Reboot, the, stop the computer, that has high impact, okay? And depending upon uh, each individual's impact level, we will automatically cause a confirmation or not, okay? So we have a default value, I forget what it is, but then you can change it. So in, that, in other words, the scenario is you've hired in a, a base, uh, a, a junior admin. You might want to be him to be more cautious than your expert admin. So again, I don't remember the name of the variable, so how would I find out the name of the variable? Dir variable, dir variable. And it was something around confirmation. Oh, confirm preference, hi. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to say dollar sign confirm preference equal low. No, no, let's do calc. Okay, now I'm going to say stop process minus name calc. And it confirms. Okay, because stopping a process I believe is a medium impact thing. And uh, because I've set my process, my confirm preference to be low, Anything that's um, above that uh, will automatically prompt for confirmation. I'll say no. I'll set it back. Hi. Stop it, and it just goes away. Okay. The last thing I want to talk to you about is errors. You are going to encounter errors. Errors are a normal part of life. They happen all the time. And let's talk about them. So imagine I want to stop the process. It's ID 132333. Now it turns out these are safe things to try and kill because for some reason Windows has no processes that end in, in odd numbers. So, so there, you generated three errors, okay? Couldn't find a process with identifier 13, couldn't find one with 23, couldn't find one with 33. And the question is, hey, was that the correct uh, behavior of the system? Like, should it have really tried to continue on after it found the first one? And the answer is, uh, we have a default policy, and that's the default policy. But for you, you might want to change it. And so the way you change it is through something called an error action. So you could have said, error action, I want to be stop. And there what happens is we go and we continue until we find the first error, and then we stop. Alternatively, what you could have said was, hey, I want you to, um, uh, well, this, you know, I want you to silently continue, which is to say, hey, you're going to encounter errors, I just don't want to know about them. By the way, this is quite useful when you're doing like a recursive directory search, uh, looking for some files. If you encounter a subdirectory, you don't have permissions, you'll get an error message. Often you don't care about it, so you do the directory and you say error actions silently continue. Uh, alternatively, you could say, hey, you know, I just don't know. Everything should be fine, but I could be wrong. So, so I don't know. And so what you can do is you can, you can say inquire. And here, it'll continue until we find the error, and then we ask you, what do you want us to do? And we'll say, hey, do you want to continue? Yes. Here's another one, do you want to continue? You could halt, you can continue, or you could say suspend. And suspend gives you back to the prompt. You can take a look around, look at some things. And when you exit, you go back to this, back to the question. And we'll just say halt, okay? 
Now, lastly, I want to point out this idea of a fully qualified error string. And here I'm going to make this a little bit smaller. Sorry, not too much smaller. So stop, stop, process, ID 13. No. Ooh, no. <laughs> no. Ooh, that, was, that would have been bad. <laughs> okay, so when you get an error, we tell you where it came from. Stop process. We tell you what happened and where it happened. So this is where it happened in a script. There's this idea of a category information. And the idea here is that this is information that's very easy to visually parse. Object not found, 13, int, stop process, and then the execution. Okay, and if you want to, you can actually change to the, uh, what's called category view, where that's the only thing you'll see. I'll show you that in a second. But here's the thing I want to point out. All this information is localizable, okay? Uh, so if you were in uh, France and you did this, you'd see French here, okay? But this category information and this fully qualified error ID, you won't, okay? Those are always, you know, it's just kind of, and what it's meant to do is it's meant to be used in, uh, as a search tag, okay? So here, I go to Bing, I type that, and it's this nice, unique identifier to get web content. You see other people who've had this problem, what they did about it, et cetera. When you're asking for help, you want to include that or telling people about uh, you know, how to work through the system, you always want to include the fully qualified error ID because that helps people find your content, okay? So then, again, there's this notion of a, 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 an error view, and I think that was called error view, but it's controlled, so I do a dir variable, and again, it had something to do with a view or an error. Oh, it was error view. And I've got normal view. And I could have done dollar sign error view equals category view. And now when I do stop process 13, you see I just get that. So this is really meant for sort of operations staff. People are going to use PowerShell all day long and they're going to, you know, they know what these errors are and they just want to be able to recognize them and go on. So if I type something, yeah, it's very easy. If I go back, normal view, and I do the same thing, you see there's quite a bit more text there. So categories view is uh, meant for um, kind of production staff. So we're sort of out of time here. What I really want you to walk away from is not so much any particular technique or any particular you know, concept, oh, blah, 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 but rather the spirit of PowerShell, which is explore, explore, explore. Uh, I, don't, I use get help all the time because I can't remember any of this stuff, right? It might be old age, but it might be, <laughs> there's just so many uh, commandlets out there that you really can't remember them all. So explore, you want to learn get help, get command, uh, get member, and get PS drive. And from there and the internet, you'll be able to find everything. Thank you very much.